What we're going to look at in this lesson is the SN1 mechanism of a tertiary alcohol to an alkyl halide with HBr. So we're being very specific with this. There are other variations of mechanisms like this, okay? But we will cover those later on this semester. In this case, though, to generate an SM1 mechanism, we are going to be using um, a strong acid. Now, the solvent, which will be underneath the arrow, can be a variety of things. But it does need to be an organic solvent. And it also cannot be a participating nucleophile. Now, I realize that word is not one you know yet, but we will talk about that word in some detail in Chapter 8. Basically, what a nucleophile is is an electron pair donor that can participate in the course of the reaction. And we don't want that to happen here. So since we want this to be an SN1 mechanism, we're talking about a substitution where we substitute one functional group for another, which in this case will be the alcohol for the alkyl halide. And it will be nucleophilic because we're going to have a nucleophile involved in this reaction. The nucleophile in this reaction will be the bromide. We'll talk about how that occurs, but it will be the bromide. And it will be an electron pair donor to a carbocation that is formed. And it's a carbocation because this is SM1. In the rate determining step, we actually form the carbocation. And that's the slow step of this process. So we're going to go through this step by step. Again, we are starting off with a tertiary alcohol. and we're going to use HBr on it. Now, if you need to go back and look, get out your pKa table. And if you look at that pKa table, you will find that HBr is a very strong acid. It's one of the best. And so this is a great source of protons. What it does is this HBr bond will break, and bromine is more electronegative, so it will take both of the electrons, producing a proton in solution. So we need a base to pick up the proton. And if you remember the definitions of bases from general chemistry, bases have two different definitions. One is a proton acceptor or an electron pair donor. The first is a Bronsted-Lowry definition, the second is the Lewis definition. But both of these apply in this case. Oxygen here is going to be the proton acceptor, and it's also the electron pair donor. And I want to make sure you are noticing in this reaction that it is the electrons that are moving, not the atoms. Whoops. And you will end up producing the corresponding conjugate acid base pair. Be careful with your charges. I find a lot of students have difficulty remembering charges. Now these are formal charges, not oxidation numbers. So again, if you need a review on how I'm getting these charges, you would count up half of the bonding electrons and all of the lone pair electrons. So oxygen would have five assigned to it. It's supposed to have six. So it's missing one, that's why it's a plus one. Bromine is supposed to have seven, and it has eight assigned to it. So it has an extra one. That's where the minus one is coming from. And as you can see here, the charge is still on the product side overall neutral, as it was on the reactant side. So charges have been balanced. All the atoms are accounted for. This is a balanced chemical equation. Now, this is one of the fast steps in this reaction. And the way that I know that is because the corresponding conjugate acid-base pair is weaker than the acid-base pair I started with. And you can find this out by looking at your pKa table. The acid on the reactant side is HBr. And the base was the alcohol. If you get out your pKa table, you'll find the HBr is quite acidic. It has a negative pKa. And if you look on that same chart, just below it, they have an alkyl oxonium ion which has a similar pKa to the hydronium ion. So this is the corresponding conjugate acid. Therefore, the conjugate base 
is the bromide. Now, according to chemistry rules, what actually what we actually observe, you always favor the side of a reaction that favors the weaker acid-base pair. And if you look at the pKa's, you'll note that those alkyl oxonium ions, which are like our conjugate acid here, are weaker acids than HBr. They have higher pKa's. Now they're still quite acidic, but they are weaker acids. So this is a favorable reaction. Um, a corresponding reaction from GenChem might be water reacting with HBr to give the hydronium ion and bromide ion. This is one you should have learned. But you always solvate HBr in water, and this is what you actually would have. It's a very similar reaction. The only difference here is it's an alcohol instead of water but it's still an OH bond. It's still an oxygen bound to a hydrogen, so it has similar basic properties to that of water. It's not a strong base, but HBr is a very strong acid. Okay, so once we have our corresponding conjugate acid, which is our alkyl oxonium ion, we're going to finally get to the slow step. This is why it's a 1. Now, oxygen is not happy about having this positive charge. Oxygen likes to be neutral, so it's going to break one of these three bonds that it has. Now, if you broke an OH bond, which is absolutely possible, oxygen is the more electronegative atom, and so oxygen would take those electrons, and you would go right back where you were before. You would go back to the alcohol and HBr, and that's not productive chemistry. It is possible chemistry, but it's not productive. So if we want to do something that's actually productive, we're going to break the carbon-oxygen bond. Now if you look at a pKa table, or not pKa, but the periodic table, you'll notice that oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So when this bond breaks, oxygen will get both of those electrons. This is the slow step of the reaction. It has nothing to do with the bromide. The bromide is a spectator at this point in time. And what you produce is this carbocation and water. Okay. These are the two species you produce. This is highly unfavorable. And the reason this is so highly unfavorable is the carbon is left without an octet of electrons. It's not stabilized. So on the next slide, I'm going to deviate for a moment from the mechanism. I want to talk about how this is stabilized. And I'm going to draw it a little bit differently, but not too differently. I'm going to show the sp2 hybridization of this group for a minute. It has an empty p orbital. That's where the positive charge is. Now these groups here, we had two methyl groups, and we had an ethyl group. Okay. This carbocation that you see here is stabilized by two different factors. One of them is called induction. Normally, a carbon-carbon bond is completely covalent, and you would share those electrons in the covalent bond completely equally between the two carbons. So the one I'm talking about, I'm going to show here in green, it could be any one of these three, but these bonds right here that I'm showing in green, they should normally be completely covalent bonds where the electrons are shared equally. But now they aren't. And that has to do with the fact that that carbon there with the empty p orbital has a positive charge. It's electron deficient. And so what happens is these electrons in these bonds, they start to shuttle toward the carbocation carbon because it says, ah, I need electron density. So the electrons start to spend more time by this carbon that doesn't have the octet. And that's what we mean by induction. It's the polarization of the sigma bonds. 
Okay, so it's these ones that I've shown here in green, but we are literally polarizing those bonds toward this carbocation. The other factor is called hyperconjugation, and it has to do with orbital overlap of the adjacent groups. So the adjacent groups I've shown here in red, and what happens is that this bond right here, or this bond right here, or this one here, any one of these that I'm showing you by highlighting them even harder, they can overlap with this p orbital and kind of dump some of their electron density into this p orbital is kind of what happens. Um, but they try to cover up the fact that there's this positive charge, but they bend toward this empty p orbital, trying to cover it up and protect it. So it's going to be covered by hyperconjugation and induction. Now, at this point in time, I'm going to redraw our carbocation the way I'd drawn it previously. It really wants a pair of electrons. It needs a nucleophile because it's highly unstabilized. One of the things that can happen is that water could act as the nucleophile and add to this carbocation. It is a potential nucleophile because it is an electron pair donor. Bromide is also a potential nucleophile because it also has lone pair electrons. Either one of these two chemical species could add to this carbocation. Now, if water adds, you go back here. Um, this step reverses, and you go to this structure I've shown here in green. And that's possible, but it's not productive chemistry. So we're not going to talk about that, but I want to make sure I point out that that is absolutely possible. What is more likely is the bromide will come in and act as an electron pair donor to this carbocation. And this is a fast step in this reaction. And when it's done, you produce the alkyl, hal or the alkyl halide. Um, and water would be the other product at this point.